Um, but my father was a lawyer. My mother was a high school English teacher. I grew up in Long Island in the in I in the years when the great suburban expansion was taking place. And, um, I can remember I, would, I went to a boarding school. They sent me to a boarding school called Andover. I can remember coming home from school and seeing whole towns, or finding whole towns had vanished under clover leaves. You know, it was a. And I also remember running through the woods with my friends, tearing down those surveyor signs. Not that we were tremendous ecologists or anything, but it's kind of odd to have a place where you grew up just changing every time you come back to it. I, I, that boarding school was a kind of Jeffersonian academy. As I understand Jefferson's ideas about education, they're kind of harsh, actually. He, he, there's a line somewhere where he says that we should, we should um, bring up some of the church, youths of genius from among the poor. Of course, it was, he, it was understood that the aristocratic children would be educated. And then he also talks about how every periodically we have to sweep out the chaff. <laughs> um, but Andover was sort of like that. A lot of I think half the school was on scholarship, one way or another. And when I first went there, the scholarship students had to work for their pay, you know, their, their for their tuition or something. That I think that changed when I was there. Our current president was there in the class behind me. I didn't know him well, but uh, it was a rigorous. Place, believe it or not. I mean, for some of us, anyway. Uh, easily the most rigorous part of my education. A kind of monastic place. Nasty in many ways. There was no meaningful adult supervision. Um, I, I'm, we had to go to chapel every day, I recall. And uh, I don't remember a single instance where anybody preaching to us um, said anything about the, the rampant cruelty in this, among the student body. You know, I mean, it's just like high school, except that you don't get to go home. There's no rest from it. And the horrible harassment of other students, which people like me would engage would engage in a little bit, just in order not to be on the other side. That's awful. I uh, have some awful memories of that. <laughs> and I, um, uh, my mother, my father was very reserved, but very kind, very... Uh, very cheap, <laughs> except about education. My mother was um, so high strung and um, interested in literature. Uh, I went to uh, Harvard after that, and uh, you know, kind of, I was pretty feckless for a while. But I, I'm just telling a story that I've told before. I hope it's all right to do it in this, this way. Well, I, I uh, was going to be a Diplomat. I think I was under the influence of a book. If you, I don't know if you remember, it called *The Ugly American*, and a movie. I think Marlon Brando was in it. <clears throat> I was going to be a diplomat and fix these problems. Well, I, but I took a uh, course in creative writing. My somewhere, I think this second half of my freshman year, and I wrote uh, a lot of stories, just you know, with a, a completely unselfconsciously, uh, just out of my head. I had a pretty good foundational education in English literature at, at Andover. Um, and I had to memorize great, huge, long passages of Shakespeare, among others. But I, I'm still grateful for that, actually. But I, I just wrote these stories without any sense of, you know, um, fashion or anything. And they, they were, they, they actually, I guess they some of them were okay. I mean, they in, in that they had some some good dialogue, some dialogue that people might have, someone human might actually have uttered. And uh, the, the, what I remember about it is that the professor liked them, you know, quite a bit, and so did some of the young women in the class. And I, this, I know this is true, that one of the, really my first strong impulse to become a writer w was lay there in that idea that it was a way to meet and impress girls. You know, it was a very romantic thing back then. And this is, I'm talking about the 60s now. Hemingway and Fitzgerald and Faulkner were still somehow um, like, like our, the current rock stars, to, to me anyway, and I think to a lot of people. It's too bad it's not that way anymore. Anyway, <laughs> I, I got into the next year, so I began to conceive of myself as a writer. And uh, the next year I got into, uh, a man named Robert Fitzgerald came to Harvard, uh, a poet and translator. 
he was a wonderful teacher. And I got into his class, which was they had to, was competitive to get into. I, uh, and I was very pleased with myself. He was, um, he was just terrific. He made you, you know, he, he did something that's very hard for, I think, for teachers of undergraduates to do, particularly in something like writing. Just he took us seriously. And, and, and he was very demanding. But, he, but I, I remember his saying, I, the only reason to write is to write something classic, and I expect classic work from all of you this term. I think, what in the world is he talking about? You know? But it was kind of, it was exciting. He'd say things like, uh, he'd point at the wastebasket and he'd say, the greatest repository I know of for writers, and I do hope it will precede me. <laughs> it was great. And he would, every so often he'd read, he'd read, aloud, he'd read aloud to us. We had to write in class. It was a long, long class. I, I loved it. We had to write in class. I remember, and he made me write, try to write poetry, which I, you know, I've always loved to read, but never had any real desire to write or, or any, or any knack for, really. Um, I finally got off one that he kind of liked and said, at the bottom said, this is very like a poem. <laughs> Uh, and he would read aloud from, you know, stories by, and, and poems from friends of his, you know, people like Wallace Stevens and Flattery O'Connor, James Agee. That was, and he tells us a little bit about them. There was, there was nothing, there were, there were, he was very unaffected, as I recall. I thought, this was just a matter of interest. And, uh, and every so often he'd read aloud a story by a student, and he, one time, to my great astonishment, horror, and then enormous delight, he read one of mine. And, and he never did again. <laughs> and I, I kept hoping that he would. Somehow or other, uh, I, uh, anyway, that, that's really where I can see. I, I would, I spent all my time writing for him. I would, I think what I wrote, and I think this is true, is that, is that I had acquired a, a, a sleep disorder and, a, and an assigned reading disability. I couldn't read books that were assigned to me, but I was reading novels at a clip I'd never, I've never equaled since. I think I read almost all of Joseph Conrad, and, or a lot of him, and Dickens, and you know, all kinds of stuff that I had, hadn't read. But if it had, were assigned to me in a class, I couldn't read it, usually. I wasn't that was true, but I would, I would stay up all night writing stories for Mr. Fitzgerald, and then I'd go to sleep around the time when my other classes began. You know? mm -hmm. Anyway, I was hooked, and, and then I kind of blundered into the Vietnam War. Um, that's, an, that's a long and rather complicated and somewhat puzzling story to me, still puzzling. 